Well, good morning. Welcome to the Gathering of Family Church. We are in our last week of our Sola series, where we spent the last five weeks so far looking in depth at what is known as the five solas that have been recovered from the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Those solas commonly known as grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, for God's glory alone. I mentioned in the first week we could summarize these all together in a sentence, and it would go like this. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, for the glory of God alone. This morning, I have the privilege of ending our series with what we could really call the capstone, the reason for the grace, the faith, salvation through Christ according to the scriptures, and that would be the central goal for God's glory alone. I want to begin with an effect that this concept had in the years following the recovery of this sola for God's glory alone. John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion in the closing lines read this, there is no work so lowly that it does not shine before God and is not very precious, provided we are serving our vocation in it. This would have been in contrast to really what the Roman Catholic Church had been teaching because to serve God in that context would have been to be in the church, to be a a priest or a cardinal, to be a man of the cloth. But out of this came, no, God can be glorified in any profession. And so this is really what's called the doctrine of work, the concept that all of us, regardless of what profession it is, are able to bring God glory in whatever it is we are called to do. In the decades following the Protestant Reformation, a man grew up in Germany who lived this out, and I want to begin the sermon for us to see a picture of what it means to live for the glory of God. You might know this man, the famous composer Sebastian Bach. I want to share a little bit of this history that you might not have known about Johann Sebastian Bach, and I want to read a little bit from his childhood. His parents died when he was around 10 years old, so he went to live with his brother who was a church organist. Now, He began learning the organ, but his brother locked away the the more classical difficult pieces downstairs in a wooden lattice cabinet for two reasons. Number one, because that work was expensive and children should not have been playing with it. But number two, because Bach was not yet old enough or he didn't think was good enough to be able to play these classical pieces. But Johann had already mastered the beginning pieces and wanted something more difficult to play. And so each night while his brother slept, he would sneak downstairs, reach his hand through the lattice cabinet, grab the music, and by moonlight, he would begin to transpose piece by piece onto another sheet of paper, note by note, all the way through. It took him six months sneaking downstairs, little by little, to put these pieces together. And so he would write a little each night and go back to bed, sneaking back to bed, excited about the new music that he would play the next day. Bach's father's cousin, Christoph, was an organist at church. And instead of going and playing with the other kids, he would sneak into the church and hide behind pews and lay down behind pews just to listen to the music. He got his first job playing as a church organist at the age of 17. He worked at a couple of churches over the next few years, seeking to lead worship in those churches and give praise to God. He said this, I have always kept one end in view, namely to conduct a well-regulated church music to the honor of God. At one church where he worked, the people began to complain about his music. Isn't this incredible? I mean, I just thought this was so funny. Is, Is Matt in here? So we've had this problem before, right? I mean, in the church. And so they were complaining about his music, saying that it was too complicated and therefore sinful because it took attention away from God in its complexity. 
Their criticisms cut Bach deeply, and he was stunned, and he said this, the main purpose of my music is to glorify God. Some people do this with music that is simple. I haven't chosen to use a simple style, but my music comes from my heart as a humble offering to God. This honors God no matter what musical style I use. From this season of pruning came a practice that would ultimately mark his legacy for generations to come. Whenever he sat down to begin to write a composition, he bowed his head and he prayed this, Jesus, help me show your glory through the music I write. May it bring you joy, even as it brings joy to your people. Before even writing one note, Bach would etch on the top of the page, JJ for Jesu Juva, Latin for Jesus help or J-H, the German equivalent of the same phrase. Help this be for your glory. If you look at his music, you see those initials at the top, and it's him in prayer saying, God, this is for your glory. When he was done with his work at the bottom, he would write the initials S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria, meaning for God's glory alone. This is an example of how one man sought to glorify God with his profession. Just as in all the other solas, this word alone is key. Because it's not just that God gets some of the glory, it's that God should get all of the glory. God alone is the one who deserves all glory. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 11 this morning. Romans chapter 11, we see this, marks it very clear for us. For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever. Amen. In this passage, we see that everything that does exist has been made for his glory. We have an illustration where we see from God, we need to understand for it has been from God, all things have been created. And it is through God, all things exist and therefore his purpose to bring him glory. And it is to God, the purpose of why all things have been created to bring him glory. A similar passage, if you turn over to Colossians chapter one, verse 16, it says this, For by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. I meant to give a disclaimer a little bit earlier. This might be one of those sermons that you need to go back and listen to because we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to start speeding some things up, but we have a ton of scriptures to get through this morning. In passages like this, Martin Luther started to see and develop and articulate a distinction between what he saw in the scriptures versus what he saw happening in the Roman Catholic Church. And he articulated and contrasted these two differences between what he saw in the scriptures and the church in the following way. He said this, a theology of glory versus a theology of the cross. These were two big distinctions in Martin Luther's mind. And he concluded the theology of glory was a man-centered glory. And the theology of the cross was a God-centered glory. But it's more than that. In 1518, he said this regarding a theology of the cross. Supreme example of this is the cross itself. God triumphs over sin and evil by allowing sin and evil to triumph apparently over him. His real strength is demonstrated through apparent weakness. This was the way a theologian of the cross thought about God. The opposite of this was a theologian of glory. In simple terms, the theologian of glory assumed that there was a basic continuity between the way the world is and the way that God is. If strength is demonstrated through raw power on earth, then God's strength must be the same, only extended to infinity. To such a theologian, the cross is simply foolishness, a piece of nonsense. We're going to get into this and see some practical applications of this, but Luther saw Roman Catholicism to have what he called a theology of glory. This is the idea that man is the focus. 
It's about man getting better and better. The more faith we have, the more good works we do, the more blessings we get. And at the end of it, it's not from God, for God, to God. It's from God, for man, to man. And that's a focus of a theology of glory. It's a view that our theology and our view of scriptures is more about us receiving blessing than God receiving glory. That's the reason it's called a theology of glory, because it's about our glory instead of Christ's glory. And Martin Luther saw the Roman Catholic Church was about political power and positions and money and prestige and offices, and it was not solely and wholly focused on the glory of God alone. So this was man seeking his own glory, not what Christ had accomplished through the cross, It wasn't a focus on Jesus as our high priest, but on priest. It wasn't a a focus of what the sacrifice was on the cross, but instead indulgences. A theology of the cross we see in 1 John 3.30. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. A theology of the cross in Luther's eyes was a focus on Christ and not yourself as the primary beneficiary. We need to understand, yes, we benefited from Christ's sacrifice, but Christ's coming was not just for your salvation alone. We were not the end goal alone. We tend to think this way. Many Christians and many churches begin to think this way, and when you begin to think that Jesus came for your benefit and your salvation apart from God's glory, we begin to prioritize the wrong things. We begin to prioritize the means of how God receives glory rather than the purpose of him receiving glory. So we start to focus on salvation alone. We begin to focus on how just to get people saved instead of salvation as a means to glorify God. And in a process And so churches begin to just think it's only about salvation rather than the glory of God. And once they've accepted Jesus as Savior, then we move on to the next person. And it's not about glory to God. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 20. We're going to be in this passage a lot this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. It says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. I want us to see what we just read that God is taking credit for in creation. In verse 16, all things were created, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. We need to understand these are earthly governments. These are kings. These are dominions. These are, by the way, the very thrones, dominions, governments, and rulers that so often war against God, his people, and his church. Do we see that? These are the people often throughout history that are at war with his purposes, at war with his people, and at war with his gospel and his church. And he just said he created them. And for what purpose? For his glory. He created them for him, and he will rule over them. Look with me in the rest of the verses. All things were created through him, and these governing authorities, these rulers, these powers, these principalities— that are against God, they were created for his glory. Verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Look at verse 20. I want you to reconcile verse 20 with your theology. Does it fit? Through him to reconcile to himself all things. That all things is in reference to governments, kings, dominions, and authorities. It says they were from him and through him and for him and for his purpose. For what reason? 
to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, we're not just talking about heavenly things, he's going to reconcile, he's going to reconcile earthly things, or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He has saved you. He has redeemed you. You are now part of his plan and his purpose. And that plan and that purpose is to redeem the rest of the world for his glory. Do we believe that this morning, church? That God is desiring to use you to redeem the world for his purpose, for his glory. Do you believe that, church? Because if you do, that means we are marching forward in victory, not defeat. Something for us to see a point this morning, you've not only been saved from, you've been saved to. Pastor Terry referenced this Wednesday at our communion service. Your salvation was not only reactive, being saved from your sins, from God's wrath, but it was proactive because you have been saved to something, not just saved from. When we think we've only been saved from our sins for heaven, who's the beneficiary there, church? I am, right? I am, you are. If we think that's what he came for alone, then we are the primary beneficiary. But God didn't say he just came to save us. He came to save us to something, and that is to bring him glory. So he is the primary beneficiary. We benefited in that. And so we are called to proclaim his cross, and we are to do that through his church. I have a personal illustration I want us to see here from my childhood that hopefully helps us see that God has gifted us and blessed us with salvation for a purpose. And when we don't live in that purpose, we are thieves of God's purpose, thieves of God's glory. Now, I want to give a disclaimer here. This was in my BC days, okay, before Christ days. So in middle school, my friends and I, we'd go to lunch and we got lunch money from our parents right? And so we started having the ideas, you know, great ideas just follow and you listen to other people's great ideas. So we just started realizing that this was like an allowance and that we started thinking, you know, we could just save this money and not buy lunch at school with our lunch money, but we can just pack our lunch from home, right? And so our parents had it in their mind, we're buying lunch at school. But in reality, we'd make our lunch at home put in our bag, go to school, and not buy lunch. And so who's actually paying for that? Our parents, right? They were giving us money for lunch, but they were also buying all the food at home. So we were getting the best of both worlds. We were not paying for food here, and we were getting to save this extra money here. I mean, I even remember some of my friends not eating lunch all the time. They would never eat lunch. Why would they not eat lunch? because they would wake up late and they didn't want to use their money. It wasn't that they didn't have money. They had money. They had tons of money because they were saving it every single week. And when you begin as a middle schooler saving five, six dollars a day every week, you know, so you have $25 a week, it starts adding up to where hundreds and hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars over years. So I want to ask, do you think that the parents would have thought that that was in some way theft? You start thinking about it, well, were were we using the money how it was intended to be used? No, right? No. We, We were taking advantage of it, thinking we were the primary beneficiaries of this. But in reality, we were taking advantage of our parents, and we were using their gift not for its intended purpose. And the same thing happens when Christians think their salvation was for them and them alone, not for a different purpose. And that's exactly what happens so many times in churches. It leads us to our next point. A Christian that is not committed to a local church is a Christian that thinks his salvation was the main point of Christ's coming. P.S. It wasn't right? It's, it's us thinking that the parents give us money so we can save it and not spend it on lunch and instead take food from home. So if that's what you're doing, you're doing what I was doing in middle school, stealing, because it was not for you and you alone. It's a benefit. 
It's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is you have been saved from your sins for a purpose. You have now been saved to glorify God. That is the purpose. That is the point of your life. You have been bought with a price. Why? To bring him glory. We already read in Colossians 1.20 that it was through him he desires to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Leads us to another point. Jesus came not just to give us salvation, but to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, for his glory. Taken right out of Colossians. That's his purpose. That's his plan to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or in earth. I want to ask do we believe it is part of God's plan to redeem the world? Do we believe that, church? He's going to redeem the world to reconcile the world. Do we believe that the world is a lost cause for God, a lost war? For God, sometimes churches preach that way. Sometimes Christians believe this way, that things are going, as I once did, that things are going from bad to worse to worse, and eventually God's just going to have to come in and save it because the plan didn't work out. Or that God just couldn't, he couldn't redeem things, therefore he's going to come and destroy it all. Which is exactly opposite in many ways what scripture says he's going to do. This was really made popular recently in the Left Behind series of books with a new kind of teaching that God had a desire to do things and he just couldn't do it. He couldn't change the tide of the culture or the world. And so eventually he's just gonna have to save the few Christians that are there and destroy the world. It angers and saddens me that I can use the next illustration as a comparison, but I think you will completely see the picture and the comparison, the illustration is this. Do we see God's plan with his gospel and his church in the world ending in similar ways how we see Afghanistan ending right now? So Afghanistan's a picture of the world and the Americans that are there and the Christians that are there and the people that should be getting out are like the Christians in the world. We see the debacle on the news And for many people's thoughts, they think, how could we let it end this way? There's no reason for the chaos and the ruins that have occurred there over the last few days. So I'm going to ask you, is Afghanistan ending also similar to how we view the church and the the gospel and the world ending in the future? Going from bad to worse. But it's even worse than that because it's not a man running this show, it's God. But we sometimes think, it's going to end exactly the same way. I mean, even in our human thinking, the Afghanistan situation is a disaster. Yet we know that with the power of the United States, it should have ended differently. And if that's true, then why would we come to the conclusion that God, who is infinitely more powerful than any military, infinitely more wise than any politician, is going to have similar results of Afghanistan compared to his church. Why do we think that that would happen? Even with humanly means and humanly wisdom, we know what it should look like. How much more when the coalition is led by God with all his power, with all his wisdom, is this going to come to his plan, his fruition of redeeming all things, all people, all nations to himself? Truth be told, many Christians have bought into the belief that Jesus will lead a similar narrative in the future with his bride. That being the world is going to go from bad to worse. It's a lost cause. It's a lost war. And we, on behalf of God, are just trying to get as many people on the C-130 plane of salvation before the airport is overrun to fly people out because things are going to get so bad. I want to encourage us and challenge us in our thinking this morning. Is that the God we sing about on Sunday, that he's he's losing a war. I mean, we just sang our, our first two songs was about God being victorious, God never losing a battle, that we fight on our knees and he always wins. Now, there may be times where it looks like God loses, just like it did to the disciples 
with the crucifixion of Christ. But we know the story, what happened, right? That was actually part of the plan. That was the victorious plan showing that God had actually defeated Satan, the flesh, sin, and even death. And so God's plan was actually victorious in that moment, and he will receive all the glory. We already read that he created thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities for his purpose, for his glory. Sometimes we forget this. Exodus chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. Listen to what it says here. For by this time, God says, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you, speaking to Pharaoh and your people with a plague to wipe you off the earth. So God could have with Pharaoh, when he was going against his people, right? He could have just, boom, done, struck them, destroyed them, taken them out of the picture instantly. God says, I could have done that, but I didn't. Because I have raised you up for this very purpose. For what purpose does God raise up thrones, dominions, powers, and authorities like we read earlier in Colossians? We saw it in the Old Testament. For this very purpose, I put you in the position, Pharaoh. I brought you to this purpose that I might display my power to you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Do we see that these are like pawns in God's chessboard? that these thrones and dominions and powers and rulers and kings and pharaohs are for the purpose of bringing God's glory. Do we see this church? It's important for us to understand because when we are enslaved in a situation and we think the world is over as the Egypt or as the nation of Israel did with Pharaoh, God says, no, I put him there. And ultimately I'm going to get glory. I'm going to get glory. In Daniel chapter seven, Verses 13 and 14, we read this. This is a picture of Jesus Christ being given dominion and power and authority. It says, I saw in the night vision, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, speaking of Jesus. He came to the ancient of days, this is God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him, Jesus was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. What do we read about the kingdom in the New Testament? John the Baptist came and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is what church? 2,000 years away or near, right? He said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Then a little bit later in Jesus' ministry, he said, the kingdom of God is what? Upon you. And then he says, listen, if I, if I cast out demons, it's because the kingdom of God is here. And so we have a picture in the New Testament that the kingdom of God had been inaugurated with Jesus Christ. That we, in some way, are living in his kingdom. And what does scripture say about his kingdom? It will grow like what kind of seed? Does anyone know? A mustard seed, which starts out what? Very small, and then it grows and grows and grows, bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we are in the kingdom, which was inaugurated in the New Testament with the coming of Jesus, was shown to be true with the death, burial, and resurrection, him being victorious, and the kingdom has been established. His kingdom has no end. We pray the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom what? Come, your will be done on where? Earth as it is in heaven. This is not a picture of us trying to get to heaven. This is a picture of heaven coming to earth on God's kingdom. Heaven to earth. May we begin to live as you have called us to live. So his kingdom is growing as a mustard seed starting out small and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's exactly what we've seen through history. There are more Christians in Iran today than there have ever been. There are more Christians in China today than there has ever been. 500 years ago, there are more Christians today than 500 years ago. 500 years ago, there were more Christians then than there were 500 years before that. And so we see, and I know this is different than what I grew up hearing, that the gospel is growing just as Jesus said it would grow, as a mustard seed expanding in the earth. And when God and his church encounter confrontations with rulers and powers and authorities, God created those rulers, powers, and authorities for what purpose? to show his glory in the earth. 
We just saw this this week. In California, of all places, where John MacArthur's church stood firm that church is essential, and the government tried to shut him down, and he said, we will be faithful. And they were awarded their lawsuit with $800,000 that the state has to pay their church. In California, of all places. Let's give God praise for that, right? This is a picture. This is a picture of God raising up Gavin Newsom for the purpose of declaring the foolishness of man to God's glory. Just like with Pharaoh, we see in Daniel chapter seven, he was given dominion. He was given glory and a kingdom. For what purpose? That all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Do we believe all people and nations are going to serve him? This is not just a hypothetical that we have some people from that nation to serve him. This is nations in the future because the the mustard seed of the kingdom will continue to expand and it will one day engulf the world, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is a glorious thought that God's gospel is going to do this in the future. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, one that shall never pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. We talk about the Great Commission. The Great Commission, what does it say? All power and authority has been given unto me. Go therefore, right, and proclaim. You have been given through Christ. He has been given all power and authority. It's in reference, it's in reference to Daniel that he has all power and dominion and authority. There is no other. How could Jesus say all power and authority and dominion has been given to him if he doesn't have all power and authority on the earth? And so God is going to transform the world, the people, the nations, languages to know him. And it's not just going to be by force. It's going to be out of a love for him. It's going to be out of a love for him. People are upset about Afghanistan because they know, we know, we have the capability to do whatever it is we want to do. It's not a matter of ability. It's not a matter of if we don't have a, if we have enough troops or not. We know it's a matter of will, political will. How much more so does God have the capability to do what he wants? Do we see this? I mean, if we can do whatever we want, As a human nation, God can do whatever he wants to do in his world that he created. Romans chapter nine, listen to what it says. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who alone has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. How can we seek to live in such a way, the belief that God will receive all glory due to him from the entire world? How can we believe that? How is that going to happen? Well, God tells us how in his word. It's going to be done through his church, through his bride. How do I know this? Scripture teaches it all throughout scripture. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three, beginning in verse seven. He says this, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So why was the gospel given to the Gentiles? We read it in verse 10. Look with me what it says. So that through the what? Church, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to whom? Rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So we already read in Colossians that rulers and authorities, principalities and powers had been created for who? For God, from God, for his purposes, right? 
to demonstrate to the world his power and his glory. And now he's saying how this is gonna happen. How are principalities and powers and how is the world going to see God's glory through these principles and powers and governments that he created for his purpose? How is it going to happen? Through the church. Through the church. And so God has set up the antagonist and God has set up Jesus as the victor. And how Jesus works against the antagonist is through his people in his bride, the church. It says in verse 10, through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Daniel taught us that nations and people and authorities would bow down to worship Christ. Now we're seeing how it would happen. Scripture teaches us that the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to them, and it was through the power of the church. Look in verse 11, same passage. This was according to the eternal purpose that has been realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So his purpose was God has a means, God has the plan, and God has a purpose. The means was Jesus Christ. The plan is to accomplish it in his church, and the church points all honor and glory to Jesus Christ. This is like the military outpost on earth for his will to be done, to demonstrate to the nations, to demonstrate to those people who don't know Christ, his glory, his love, his power. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the, in the church. All honor and glory and power, it says, to him be glory, not just in the world, not just in the community, not just with creation. It says, to him be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Your salvation was to bring him glory in the church. John 13, 35, Jesus says, by our love for one another, the world will know you are his disciples. Galatians six ten says the same thing. Similarly, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, but especially those who are of the household of the faith. There is a special kind of love. There is a special kind of service. You, we are to demonstrate to one another in the church. Excited that this last Sunday, we had a new members luncheon. For those interested in becoming members here at the church, we had 19 people come to become members of the church in this luncheon. And we must have did something wrong because we tried our best to steer some of them away. All right? I'm saying this jokingly, but we kind of treat this like a date. We bought the dinner. We're, we're sharing with them all our flaws. We shared how we sometimes leave dirty socks on the floor. I mean, we were telling them we're not perfect. And all of them still wanted to be members after we, we kind of shared all of this. And so praise the Lord for that. But it's this God growing his church and it is to be done in his bride. We see in the days of Luther that just becoming a member of a church, just becoming committed to a church doesn't mean that a theology of glory doesn't exist in our life anymore. We sometimes might think, all right, if it's a theology of the cross or a theology of glory being part of a church, is not being a glory thief anymore, then I'm safe. But I I want us to know just joining a local church doesn't mean we no longer have to be on guard for a theology of glory to captivate our hearts. John Calvin said this, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. Calvin says our hearts are always churning out new ways for us to receive a little piece of glory from God that we are always trying to get a little piece of the show. And this happens all the time in all of our hearts, but especially mainstream Christianity. I want to share with you some titles taken from a few sermons of a mainstream church just recently. And I want to ask you from the titles of these sermons, is this about God's glory or man's glory? Is this a theology of glory or a theology of the cross? Here's number one. It's always been in you. It's always been in you. Now, Pastor Terry, I think, likes this sermon title. 
Because he's thinking, clearly they're talking about the depravity of man, right? Clearly they're talking about sin. It's always been in you. Terry's like, I kind of like that one. It's always been in you. He's going to talk about sin and our need for the Savior. But here's one of their points from the sermon. There is something in you that has always been greater. Something in you that's always been greater. It's not talking about sin at all. It's talking about the greatness of something within you that God placed there. So we see the purpose. Other recent sermon titles, Unleash Your Limitations. Creston, isn't that a sermon series you want to hear? You have limitations and God wants you to unleash your limitations. They made this really easy because I didn't have to listen to all these sermons. When you click on it, you actually see some quotes that they pull out of the sermon for Instagram tags and t-shirts. And this was one of the quotes for this one. God isn't looking for perfection. He's calling out potential. Right? He's calling out potential. Three more sermon titles. You were built different. Isn't that encouraging? You were built different. I mean, you just hear that and you're like, yes, I was made different. All the billions of people on earth, I was made different. Another sermon title, it's your time, exclamation mark. It's your time. Last, your season to succeed. Your season to succeed. Mainstream Christian church, thousands upon thousands in attendance. I want to ask, I want you to to think, and I want to ask you, is the focus of every single one of these sermon titles and the points of these sermons about God's glory or about man's glory? Do you, see the, do you see the danger that our heart would love, even unbelievers would love to come and hear a, a sermon about how to succeed, how to be better, how to unleash your limitations? These sermons are what Luther would call a theology of glory. Isaiah chapter 6, we can compare this. When Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. You don't see him say, God's looking for potential. One of the seraphim flew to me. Listen, after he acknowledged his sin and that he wasn't just having some limitations, he saw he was a broken, sinful man, not deserving to be anywhere near the Lord. One of the angels flew to him because what he had just admitted was that he was nothing. The angel flew to him and he touched his mouth with a burning coal. Behold, this has touched your lips. Therefore, your guilt is taken away, your sins atoned for. This is a picture of the theology of the cross, that we are on our knees before the Lord. And we acknowledge our sinfulness and his majesty and his perfection. And because of that acknowledgement, because of that dying to self, it's not, I'm pretty great. I have a lot of potential. I'm a good guy. There's limitless expectations within me. God wants to use me. No, it was, I am undone. I am nothing. Therefore, his sins were forgiven. All of our sinful hearts sitting in messages like that would love them. We could say, I want that. I want a healthier marriage. I want a a better success life. I want more friends. I want more wealth. I want 10 ways to be successful in business. I want, I want, I need. It appeals to even the most sinful of man. These messages are ones that even people who don't love Christ, who don't know Christ, be excited to listen to. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us first and foremost to die to ourself. Luke 5, 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's a picture of a theology of the cross. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory, I give to no other, nor praise to carved idols. Remember, our hearts are like idol factories, always seeking to get a little bit of glory from God. 
even in a sermon. I am the Lord and there is no savior but me, Isaiah 43, 11. Reiterating, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, ultimately for the glory of God alone. As we come towards the end, I've shared with you God's desire for your salvation, his purpose for his church, how he will redeem the world. Is my belief that we see clearly in scripture that, that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated and it is growing and getting bigger and bigger and the gospel spreading more and more and we serve a victorious God. It's not going to end in failure like Afghanistan. God is going to conquer and be victorious, bringing all people to himself for the name of himself. Worthy is the lamb to be praised. And that's what will happen. So this importance of understanding a theology of glory and a theology of cross is essential for us today. I want to ask, how are we to glorify God today? How are we to glorify God today? 1 Corinthians 10 31, a well-known passage says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism written in 1647 The first question says this, what is the chief end of man? And we can say this part together. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So what do you exist for, church? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why here at Family Church, we say our purpose Our purpose, we are called to glorify God. We're to love his word. That's why we exist, is to bring him glory. Therefore, God is glorified in how we treat our spouse. God is glorified by the homeschool parent sacrificing a second paycheck in order to raise their children to love and know the Lord. God is glorified by how you conduct yourself at work. God is glorified by having conviction and standing up for truth at work. God is glorified by how you love the church, his bride, by your service to her. God is glorified in your personal fight against sin. God is glorified in seeking ways to share the gospel. God is glorified when you believe his plan and purpose is to redeem the world. God is glorified in us seeking to be holy men and women. God is glorified in us capturing our thoughts and putting them to death for the sake of his son. God is glorified in grandparents seeking to influence your grandchildren for the purpose of the Lord to taste and see the goodness of God. God is glorified in the small mundane moments of life and the big decisions of life. It's for what purpose he has saved you. It's important for us to understand our salvation is a benefit and blessing, not the primary purpose of Christ's coming. His primary purpose Yes, we received blessing and benefit from that, but it's all for his purpose and his glory. Sometimes we think, and people have a struggle, that God is a jealous God because they think jealousy is wrong. Well, I want to ask you, who else could be worshipped but God? For God to have envy of another or for God to worship another and not demand worship of himself means he has created an idol because there is nothing else deserving of worship. If God desires and pursues that, something else receiving glory but himself, he is now an idolater and he has broken his very commands. Therefore, there is no other purpose but for God to receive all worship and glory and honor. I want to ask everyone here today, what are you living for? If you look at your week, you look at your month, what are you living for? Or to ask it another way, a more purposeful way, who are you living for? Who are you living for? If you're living for yourself as a Christian, you have bought into the lie that your salvation was the primary purpose of Christ's coming. You are the king on the throne and God blessed you with a great life and forgiveness of sins and a future promise of eternity with him. And you're the primary person rather than God. And that's a theology of glory. And Jesus said, no, I came 
He came and he was given power and dominion and glory and honor. And we exist to glorify him because he is worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We benefit from this in a great way of our sins being forgiven, but we now have been saved from something to be saved to something. And we exist to serve him and love him and honor him and give him praise. And the primary way we're to do that is in his church that he's given his life for. And it's through the church that we go out into the world and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the evidence. We don't need to prove the cross. The cross was the evidence of his coming. The cross was the evidence that he reigns. All power and authority has been given unto Christ and he gave it to us to go and proclaim the gospel. And so that's what we're called to do and to go with authority and encouragement that God is victorious. He's going to win the battle. And so his his word has authority. And so we can go with this promise that God is doing this and I get to be a part of it. I want to end with 1 Peter 4, 11. If anyone speaks, he should speak as one conveying the words of God. If anyone serves, he should serve with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? God, help us to see this morning who we are living for. I pray that men and women and teenagers and students would see a picture this morning that if they have been living for themselves, seeing their salvation, seeing what you've done for them as the primary, as them as the primary means and beneficiary of this, God, help us to repent of that. God, we're, we're sorry for when we act like we are the end goal. We are a part of a means to bring you honor and glory. It's so easy for us to think that you came just for us because the gift you gave us was so incredible that it's so easy for us to think we're the end goal because the gift you gave of forgiving all of our sins and that you have made us heirs with Christ, that we are to inherit all the things that you own, which is everything. It's so easy for us to think that this is our party. It's for us. And it's true, we get to benefit from all of your victories because you have called us co-heirs with you. But help us not forget, this was all for you and from you and to you. To you will receive all glory and honor and power. Help us to boldly proclaim and to go in this world that things are not going to end like Afghanistan. Because you are not a human that does things, how we do things. We know how it should have been done and how much better will it be done under your power and your control with your reign. So God, help us to be faithful. Help us not to just look at moments where it looks like you have been defeated, but to know you often love to use what looks to be failure as actually means of victoriously triumphing over the enemy, because you set up the chessboard. You created it all. So help us have faith that you will and are winning the battle and the war, and we are called to go in that mindset, just as we have been declared the great commission to go because you are redeeming people for your purposes in every nation, with every tongue, in every tribe. So God, we thank you for your goodness. We come to you where we can worship and sing of your greatness one more time this morning. What a privilege it is. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.